So this is lecture 24 of ECE 503. So in today's lecture, what we're going to be looking at is essentially how do we design IR filters? And more importantly, because you know we're dealing with analog sources of information, but then we convert them through analog to digital conversion into the digital domain, and we're probably going to play with digital filters, right? How do we design digital filters that have the same desired effects as an analog filter? So let, let, me, let me take away the punchline, or not punchline, let me take the surprise out of this lecture, okay? So what ends up happening is, in real world, what we want to do in the old days, So let me see. Let me get a good gauge of what old days means to people. So other than Chad, maybe. I'm not sure how old you are. So let's say bef before 1985. Okay, so, okay, so us three, I think we'll, we can relate. No, no, okay. Just kidding. I mean, really old days. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to date myself. So, <laughs> so what happens is, we usually, let's say, have an analog signal, right? Continuous time, analog signal. And what happens is that signal goes into an analog system. And out is produced some sort of desired target signal. Okay? And what ends up happening is, so let's say we call this H of T. And so, in the old days, this guy was probably resistors, inductors, capacitors, and many other things. So, let's say you want to filter out noise, right? Old school. What do you do? You design an analog filter. It focuses, it allows the desired signal within a frequency band to pass through and attenuates everything else, right? Now, digital age, the age of iPad. So today's, today, i.e., the iPad generation, okay? It's true. What happens is analog signal, right? Continuous time, analog signal. Now what happens is hits Analog to digital converter now is digital signal. Digital. Okay? Apply digital filter, H of N, and then get target signal out of it, right? We might also convert it back into an analog signal, right? We might push it back into a digital to analog converter and spit it back out, right? We can do that. Now, here's, here's the messed up thing. The messed up thing is, in a lot of cases, when we teach, or our intuition for these signals, like these analog signals, we still teach in a lot of courses, and we still think analog filtering, right? When, like, you know, look at any curriculum, right? Engineering curriculum, electrical engineering curriculum. What do you learn first? Continuous time signals and systems, right? This is the continuous time Fourier transform. This is the continuous time Fourier series. That's what gets ingrained first. Why? Because it's usually the first course out of circuits and systems, where you learn about caps and inductors and resistors and you know, RLC circuits and the like. Right? And then we learn digital. Then there's this magical thing. There's this bridge. right? And it's kind of like deja vu all over again, but the damage has been done. What happens is, we still think analog. So, what this lecture is going to talk about in the latter part. So first of all, we're going to look at analog circuit design, right? We're going to look at Butterworths, Chebyshev's, and elliptical filters. And then, after that, suppose I give you analog specs. What is the equivalent digital spec? So what I want to know is, how do you map from the analog domain. So let's say I know what this guy is over here. How do I get the same 
characteristics with that guy over there. And the problem is, what's the problem? The analog filter domain, right before sampling, minus infinity to infinity. Digital, every 2 pi. Boom, 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 boom. So we have this messed up situation where now not only do we may or may not get the exact shape, but sure as heck we don't go from minus infinity to infinity. And so there's this um, weird thing, there's this frequency wrapping that we have to take into account. Right? And so what we're going to look at, first of all, like after we pass the basic types of analog filters, because I'm just going to promote bad teaching and uh, teach analog, <coughs> even though this is a DSP class. But you should know about low tech before you see high tech. And then we're going to look at impulse invariance and essentially looking at Laplace transforms and mapping them over to Z transforms. And that's not really the best approach. Then we're going to do bilinear transformation. But bilinear transformation is uber tricky to do, right? And then we'll call it a day for that lecture. Ha <laughs> ha, okay. So let's get started. iPad generation. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. So I, I at least know of two infants um, that, that when you give them an iPad, they, they're able to operate it way better than me. You know, so just, just an FYI. I think one, one student here knows, and then my own nephew. It's just like, given an iPad or an iPhone, and like he, he can probably install an app quicker than I can. So. So, okay. So, um, we saw this last time, right? So this is this, uh, what we just talked about. So we have here, so I'm using big omega. Big omega denotes analog frequency, right? Little omega, digital frequency. Big omega, right, like the really fancy $100,000 watches, represents analog frequencies. What we have here is what a lot of folks in the old days use in order to characterize an analog filter, right? Which is you got your pass band ripple, you got your stop band ripple, and you got your transition bands. This should not be a surprise to anyone, right? So pass band ripple, stop band ripple, and the transition band. We have the pass band frequency edge, the stop band frequency edge. And then we introduce two new factors that's used in analog filter design. The first is called the discrimination factor. Okay? And so it's sort of a ratio between your pass band and your stop band ripple. Like you can see here, you have like one over, like this thing here, your stop band, your pass band ripple is either one minus delta p, or it's also equal to 1 over the square root of 1 plus epsilon squared, right? And then this guy here, your, pass, your, your stop band ripple, delta s, is equal to 1 over a. So what we instead do is we bring those two terms together to give us sort of a relationship between the stop band and the pass band ripple, okay? So it's a relationship between those two ripples. The second guy, the selectivity tells us the ratio between pass band frequency and stop band frequency widths. Okay? In this case, it's m a little bit more straightforward. It's um, omega p over omega s. It's the ratio of how much signal you're passing through to how much you're rejecting. Okay? So, given that, we have three types of filters. So the first one's butter Butterworth. I'm sorry. Every time I think of Butterworth, I think of like waffles and butter on top of them and maple syrup. Mm. But Butterworth is actually a really cool filter as well. What happens is it's an all-pole realization. Chebyshev as well. The next one we're going to see, there are two types of Chebyshev. There's an all-pole realization and there's a pole zero realization. But it's nice with the all-pole, right? All I need and it's actually ridiculously easy to do this here with the Butterworth. All you need is to have a bunch of poles located equidistant on a circle of radius omega c. Really? So 
like, you know, so, so what happens is we have this form, this magnitude square response that you can see on the board, right? That H of A, J omega. So J omega, omega, people flip-flop between the two representations. This is the analog frequency response, okay? J sometimes is thrown in there, sometimes it's removed. It's the same thing, okay? It's just notation. But what Butterworth does, so we have this representation. Look at this. One plus j omega over j omega c. We'll get to the j omega c in a second. To the power of 2n. What will this, ha what will this, what, what do you predict will happen? What are the roots of the denominator? It's going to be to the 2nth root. We're going to have a 2nth root of this denominator. And we saw this before. What does this do? Whenever we take like an nth root, what do we have? It's all going to be the same magnitude, but they're going to be spaced out. Boop, 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 Equidistant on some sort of circle. It will turn out that that circle will be of radius omega c. Right? Bef so really what omega c is, we saw this before too. It's called the 3 dB cutoff. So what does 3 dB cutoff mean? So what's 3 dB? If you ever have like, you know, a music band or something, I would, like any of you who are musically inclined, call yourself the 3 dBs or something like that. That would be so cool. So 3 dB, half the power, right? So if you translate this, you take it from dB, what you'll find is it is half power. So what we're looking for is essentially on, like let's say we take this guy here. We're looking for the point of the filter where we're already half, half of the frequency response, right? So that's the 3 dB mark. And what you'll notice is that as you increase the filter order, your transition bandwidth narrows. Notice as, as you go from N equals N3, to, uh, to n equals n2, to n equals n1, where n1's larger than n2, larger than n3, we get this steeper and steeper and narrower and narrower transition band, but they all pass through the 3 dB band width value, right? And what that is, is the halfway point between 1, magnitude 1, and magnitude 0. So looking at this guy, and you try and find the roots. So what's the roots? SK? What it turns out is that is going to be the, the 2 nth root of minus 1. And we saw that. It's going to be equally spaced boop, 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 on essentially radius 1. And then it's multiplied by J omega C. So this is a beautifully simple filter. All you need is, okay, where's your cutoff? What's your filter order? Right? And then put two n zeros around a circle equally spaced of radius j omega c. And you've got your Butterworth. I still prefer the waffles. You know. <laughs> so, so what happens is if you're given the omega p, the omega s, the delta p, the delta s, you have the ingredients for building a Butterworth. So what do you need for the Butterworth? You need the omega c. Where do you get the omega c from? Where do you get the appropriate order from? Those other four parameters. What's the pass band bandwidth? What's the stop band bandwidth? What's the ripples for stop band and pass band? This will give you everything you need to know. For instance, filter order. So first of all, calculate selectivity and discrimination factors. Then take the log of each and divide them. And that will give you the minimum value for the order, n. So now you know what the order is. Now you know that 2n of those are going to be where you're going to put those poles on that unit circle. What's missing? Omega c. <laughs> so to calculate omega c, you use this equation here. You want this to lie between these two points that define the pass band and the stop band. And so now, at the end of the day, you can synthesize your filter. You can put them on that circle of J omega C, right? 
And then what, what we can do is, what, what does this guy look like? Well, what happens is, here, what's this guy? He's Laplace transforms. We haven't touched Laplace transforms. Why? We can only cover so much, right? And the thing is, the Laplace transform is a kind of a, is another variant, okay? So it's a more generalized version of your Fourier transform, right? So you have J omega, right? It's all imaginary, gives you frequency content. But the Laplace transform, that S, is equal to what? Sigma plus J omega. So now we have a DC, we have a real term in that, in addition to the imaginary portion, right? And that's used more in like folks in control theory than like communication folks. Communication folks, all we care about is the J omega and nothing else. But controls, you kind of have to have that, that as well. That's another thing. In controls, you guys do digital controls or analog controls? You do analog? Okay, okay. Because in electrical engineering, we're like, who teaches analog controls anymore? Okay, good, good, good. So aerospace does analog still. I'll talk with your advisor. I just, okay, that, we need to have a discussion. Okay, thank you. So, what happens is you have the Laplace transform. And then what happens is we have these poles and they line the left half of the plane, S plane. And I ask the big questions, why? Why? Why poles on the left half of the plane? Analog control person. Stable. Exactly. Thank you. Because what we're going to see now, actually, let's, should we go up ahead? Yes. Just a little bit. Here we go. So this is ultimately, when we do the impulse invariance, what we want to do is we want to go from this space, okay, the J omega. And this, and this is only one, like, so we have the J omega and we have that real part. And so this is your Laplace domain. We want to map this guy to the Z domain, right, in the Bode plots. And there's, some, and there's some funny business there. But what happens is when you have poles on the left half of the plane, you have it, be, it's stable. Okay. Now, Chebyshev, we, we talked about before. Other than the fact that it's a really cool Russian-sounding name, right? Um, they should have someone called Chebyshev on, like, Star Trek or something. Mr. Chebyshev. So, so what happens is we saw this a few lectures ago about the Chebyshev polynomials, right? We saw that um, Tn, so this is the nth order Chebyshev polynomial, can be assigned, uh, de uh, defined by either this cosine function or this Cauch function, depending on what the value x is equal to, right? And it can be recursive. And we saw the properties of the Chebyshev polynomial, right? So we, if, let's say, x, the input, is less than or equal to 1, the p polynomials are bounded by 1 in magnitude, and that the Chebyshev polynomial, uh, the, uh, the nth order Chebyshev polynomial is also bounded by 1 and oscillates between plus and minus 1. When it's greater than 1, it increases monotonically with x, right? We also know that the Chebyshev, nth order Chebyshev polynomial of 1 is equal to 1 for all n, for all orders, and when it's 0, it has either plus or minus 1 for n even and 0 for n odd. And then last but not least, the roots of this guy are located in intervals of minus 1 to 1. All right? A little bit of potpourri for Friday night. It's like, hey, do you know the properties of the Chebyshev polynomial? Right? So, I di I'm not going to lie, because I mentioned it before, there are two types of Chebyshev filters. So on the left half, there's type 1. And type 1 is an all-pole realization. And it's equi-ripple in the passband and monotonically decreasing in the stop band. It looks like this guy down below here, right? So equi-ripple in the passband, and then it disappears to zero in the stop band. And so it has the following response. So first of all, you notice that you have an nth order poly uh, Chebyshev polynomial that's squared. Here in the denominator, you have that epsilon squared term here, right? That controls your passband ripple. You have your passband cutoff frequency, and you have your filter order. That's how we define a Chebyshev filter. 
and the system function, again, you have all these roots, and then you have this guy at frequency 0, and it depends on what n, what order your Chebyshev filter is at. Is it n even? If it is, it's defined by this value here. If it's odd, it's uno. Uno! On the other hand, we have a type 2. Type 2 is a little bit more tricky. Type 2, monotonic passband, right? So definitely not me. I'm not monotonic, right? So it's like this now. I'm going to teach problem. Yeah. I actually had a professor like that in what course? Many, many years ago. Or was it a teacher? Oh, I'm blanking. But yeah, it, and it was just like, oh, no, no, not economics. Yeah, I can't remember. Mo most of the teachers I have, they inspired me to be dynamic and such. But yeah, monotonic, not cool. On, uh, on the other hand, it has an equi-ripple stop band. But it's messed up. It's not like nice, gentle ripples. It looks something like this. It looks all over the place. But what's kind of cool is whether, like, you know, this would be a great multiple choice question. So I've already traumatized my undergrad class a couple weeks ago when I gave them a multiple choice question on communication systems. They did not expect that. Zing! But in the nicest of ways, right? But, but honest to goodness, one really cool... So if any of you become professors, if any of you want to like, give a great DSP question on Chebyshev filters, ask them, is this filter even or odd for this type 2 Chebyshev filter? How do you know? Whether the end that goes to plus infinity, whether it goes to the top of the ripple or to the bottom, to zero. If it goes up, it's odd. If it goes down, it's even. This is so cool. If only Jeopardy can... Actually, Jeopardy does have like these little uh, images and stuff. Imagine you had something like this. Oh, yeah. Negative scores for everyone. So, so yes. So here you have both zeros and poles. You have your filter order, your pass band, your stop band, cutoff frequencies, and your epsilon that controls the stop band ripple. You have a system function that's different than before. So here are zeros. They're all located at zero. Here, we actually have some roots. We actually have zeros located not at the origin. Okay? To give us these funky looking responses. So let's say I want to design a Chebyshev filter. It's not as easy as a Butterworth. And we're just getting increasingly complex. When we do elliptical, it's even going to be harder. So Chebyshev filter, what happens is we find the values. First of all, we find out what selectivity and what discrimination factors we want for our filter. We then determine the filter order using this magical equation. So before with Butterworth, what was it? Let's go. Do, do, do. There we go. Log D over log K. Here, Cauch. Inverse of Cauch, 1 over D. Divided by inverse of Cauch, 1 over K. Doesn't roll off the tongue well, right? It's like, it's just like, oh my god, how you... First of all, if you ever see Cauch H, a lot of people say Cauch. I don't know, but when I was an undergrad and people said Cauch, I thought they were like geniuses. I don't know why. It just sounds impressive, right? Koch. You know. So, uh, then what you do is you form the rational function, just as before. To get type 1, you use this epsilon for this expression. If you have type 2, you slightly change it. You get rid of this minus 1 guy here, right? And ds is brought to the power of minus 2, rather than the entire 1 minus dp. And then you construct your system by taking the n poles of G A S and put them on the left half of the S plane. The last guy, okay, again, of these analog filters, is the elliptical filter. This is the most complex of the three that we're going to talk about before we go into the conversion, the mapping between the uh, analog domain and the digital domain. So this guy here, you know you're in trouble when you have Jacobians. <laughs> yeah, I know. Th that's one thing that intimidated me when I was a freshman, was Jacobians. I never got it. Like, that J was so intimidating. 
So what happens is here, you definitely have poles and zeros. There is no type 1, type 2. It is poles and zeros. Your frequency response looks like this. It has a Jacobian elliptical function. And you have possibly equiripple passband and stopband re regions. You have It's optimal in the sense of the smallest transition in bandwidth between, um, you know, and based on filter order, cutoff frequency in the passband, stopband ripples. But they're more challenging because you need tables or MATLAB, whichever one comes first. And the filter order, even more non-trivial than the other two. You have the discrimination factor. You have this funny Q thing that you've got to solve, and you have the selectivity factor. So I've just introduced to you guys three analog filter designs. Butterworth, muchas, easy, right? I think that's how you say it. Very easy? Yes. Then we have Chebyshev, and you have two versions of that. Getting a little bit harder, still doable. All pole version type 1, definitely doable. Type 2, a little bit more challenging, but you don't need tables, you don't need MATLAB and stuff, although that would be very helpful. Elliptical, very challenging, right? And you have to use tables, you have to use MATLAB. It's not something you can do by hand. And we do this because, remember that diagram I drew? And please, 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 yay! I still have it, I didn't erase it. Because let's suppose, in the old days, people played with this. They say, this is a 200th order Butterworth, or elliptical filter. How do I make a digital version of that? How? And the answer is one of these two upcoming techniques. So what we want to do is we want some sort of mapping function. So what we want to do is we want to take H of, uh, H A of S. This is our analog Laplace transform of our system function for that filter. And we want to map it to H of Z, which we know is discrete. It's a Z transform, right? It's a system function. So what we need to do is we need to determine how to do that mapping. So you can do the mapping from the J omega axis to the unit circle. So what we're doing, first of all, is if you have the Laplace space and you have that J omega axis, the first thing I want to do is I want to somehow bring that over to the Z plane and wrap it around and make it my unit circle. So that's part one of my mapping. Okay? That's not trivial. And what's really important is when I do that, it needs to be one to one. One value on the J omega axis needs to have a corresponding value on that unit circle. That's important. And it's got to be on two, right? And we need that in order to preserve the frequency response. Then, the points in the left hand of the S plane should be mapped to the points inside that unit circle to preserve stability, right? So in the Laplace domain, left-hand side of the plane, stable. Z transform, where should the poles be? Inside the circle. And the region of convergence emanates out, contains the unit circle. And then this mapping function should be a rational function of Z, such that this H A of S maps to a rational H of Z. Okay, so the roots that we have with H A, H A of S should map to the roots of H of Z. And so now, yes? Yep. And you know, that, that's the tricky question. <laughs> that, that's why we have these two techniques we are talking about. So both of them attempt to do this. And the problem is, so like in the Laplace domain, right? That J omega axis, where does it start? Where does it stop? It goes off from minus infinity to infinity, right? On the other hand, the unit circle, you have a 360 degree rotation. Oh. Now it's not unique anymore. So we have that issue, right? So, I mean, there's a number of things. And you look at the frequency response, 
from the analog domain to the, the digital domain, you have that frequency wrapping business. You have like the periodic replicas in the frequency domain. How do we compress something from minus infinity to infinity down to 2 pi? So these are, that's what these techniques are trying to solve. So that's a great question. That's a great question. Because, and that's why this is none, -tri this is none too trivial. Right? So like the first technique that we're looking at now. So that's a great question. The first technique that we're looking at tries to solve for that. It tries to solve for that. And the trick that we're doing is we're going to sample, we're going to sample the, the continuous, re continuous time response and then extract from that the discrete time response and use that as our digital filter. So we're go what we're going to do is we're going to just sample and be naive. Mm. So what we do, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take h a of t and sample it every t s seconds. Boom, 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 boom to get hn. And therefore, what do we have as a Fourier transform of that? We get this guy here, this expression. And notice that we have this 2 pi factor, right? 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi. What is that 2 pi business about? What happens is we have this guy from uh, the j omega axis, right? It goes from minus infinity to infinity. What we're doing is every 2 pi, every segment, every period, we map onto the same 2 pi interval. So it's almost like we're dumping at like a copy. Like, you know, let's say we take this data and copy it into this frequency range. And then the next chunk, map it onto the same region. And the next chunk, map it. So what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to take infinite amount of information and place it in that limit, that, that frequency range of 0 to 2 pi. And you can see that. Over here, this guy here, right? So when k is 1, k is 2, k is 3, dump, 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 dump. We take every interval and put it into that range. Then we, we transfer every, like we can make something a little bit more generalized. That's the Fourier transform. We can also do the Z transform domain. Same business. So what we're doing, ah, this is a perfect graphical representation. Let's zoom in on this, shall we? We shall. So what we've got here, what we're doing is we're taking every strip of the Laplace domain and we're putting it into that unit circle. So right? So what happens is this is 2 pi, this is 2 pi divided by the sampling uh, period. Dump. Next. Dump. Next. Dump. So what ends up happening is we're taking each strip of information and mapping it directly, every interval of 2 pi. So that's how we're trying to get around the infinity mapping to 2 pi business. We're basically going from minus infinity to infinity, and we're taking each chunk of data and mapping it and adding it on top of each other. All right? It's a little messed up. That's why this stuff is not trivial, because we're going from one very different domain to another. But what happens is this mapping from the j omega axis onto the unit circle, you know, it's not one to one because of that periodicity of the frequency response. So that's our problem. The 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 it's not unique across all frequencies. That that's that's not a good thing. So as a result, we need to pull a trick. We need to do something here where we can ensure that that one strip of two pi over T S, right? Somehow we only look at one of them. So What's the trick? It's got to be band limited. So this will only work if we have a band limited signal. If not, we don't get the one to one. We have onto, we don't have one to one. We don't have uniqueness, right? Because if I'm taking this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing and mapping it into the same region, I don't, I'm no longer having something unique. I have a many to one mapping. Bad news. Okay? So that's why it's important that in, across one of those strips, we have something that's band limited and not appearing anywhere else. Okay? So if we do that, what ends up happening is 
So we have these poles and zeros, and we try and map them this way. What we should end up with is, so take the Laplace transform, take the inverse Laplace transform of that guy. So if that transfer function, we get the time domain. Then we digitize it by sampling every t as seconds. And then we take the z transform, we get this guy here. And those are our roots. Check this out. E to the s k t s. What, so what we're doing is we're taking the Laplace transform, right? The system function that in the Laplace transform domain, its roots. And we're now trying to somehow map it to the z transform domain. How do we do that? E to the s k and then multiplied by the sampling time t s. All right? So if we do it this way, what we end up getting is now this guy here. But the problem is, what's the problem? We do not have a great way of mapping zeros. So this is the problem with impulse invariance. Poles, if it's an all-pole system, should work. With zeros, there's really no re uh, great way of mapping zeros over to this. Okay, That's, that's, that's the dilemma. So that's a, that's a bummer. So that's why we have bilinear transformation. So bilinear, totally cool. So this equation here, this s is equal to 2 over ts, 1 minus z to the minus 1 um, over 1 plus z to the minus 1. This guy's at the core of the bilinear transformation. So put a big box around it, put stars next to it. That's what I normally do. No, seriously, I do that. I put these like ugly big blobs. I call them stars. Everyone else calls it scribbling. And what you do is you take the Laplace transform, you plug this guy into it, boom! What you just got is you have a Z transform. And then you replace everywhere that's an S with this guy, you reconstruct it, and now you got your equivalent Z transform. And what does this mean? So if you had something with zeros and poles, you still have zeros and poles in terms of Zs instead of Ss. Yay! So if I do that, and I plug it in, so I get h of z. I can get that, but this thing is, the problem is, and I put the unhappy face, and I'm still unhappy, it's nonlinear. Because what happens is, again, we get this frequency warping, so we need to use a frequency warping function, and you know you're in trouble when you have an arctan. You know, arctan of the frequency ts over 2. This is, like, not fun. So... The process for using bilinear transformation in your problem sets will have several examples on how to do this. What you've got is you pre-warp omega s and omega p. So what you need to do is you need to use this equation here to find out. So you're working backwards. So I want a digital filter that has omega s and omega p, uh, p but little omega s, little omega p. I need to use the arctan expression to go backwards to find out what is the passband and stopband frequencies in the analog domain. Okay? So in this case, we have to see what's doable. We have to go backwards. Then you design your analog low-pass filter using those guys. You've, uh, you have, like, you know, your passband, stopband ripples. Then you go back and use that funky expression back here, this thing. You plug it into your system function, right? You take this guy, you plug it into h of s to get h of z, and then you solve. So let's, let's do a quick example together, all right? Just because I like complicated math. So what happens is this, this is a great example. So you, you're trying to design a first-order digital low-pass filter with a 3 dB cutoff frequency of omega c. Notice it's little omega, right? W, not the watch symbol, right? So what happens is omega c is equal to 0.25 pi. And we want to apply the bilinear transformation to the Butterworth filter over here. So I'm giving you, I'm giving you the analog filter, but I don't tell you what the cut analog cutoff frequency is. But I'm telling you what the digital cutoff frequency is. So what do you do? You use the arctan expression to work backwards. Okay. So what I do is, since this 3 dB cutoff frequency of the Butterworth is omega c, and we have little omega c, we then use the arctan expression 
to find out what big omega c is equal to. And it's going to be equal to 0.828 TS. Why do we do this? Because where? Because we know what 0.25 pi means because we can only have unique representations of the frequency response from 0 to 2 pi. Omega? It could be anything. How big is a low-pass filter? Right? Is it 2 hertz wide? Is it 10 gigahertz wide? Well, 10 gigahertz is big. But what is the appropriate omega C, big omega C value? So I give you the digital. I tell you what TS is equal to. And then from that, you can obtain what big omega C is equal to in the analog domain. So it's topsy-turvy. In this case, we have something now that is of real world value. So whatever your sampling is, your TS, and you take 1 over TS times 0.828, you plug it into the general expression of your, of what? Of your Butterworth filter. Now, plug in Z with that most, ex most important expression. Plug in for S this guy here and expand it out, and you get this messiness here and solve. So, okay, you might see this and say, oh my god, that's so complicated. Basic steps. You have what the little omega c is equal to. You have what TS is equal to. Solve for big omega c. Next step. From that big omega c, find out what your pass band, stop band, frequency, um, Frequency, uh, frequency values are your pass band, stop band ripple, your selectivity, your se um, selectivity, your discrimination factors, and then you try and solve for the H of S, whether it's Butterworth, Chebyshev type 1 or type 2, or elliptical, then plug in the S is equal to that Z business there, isolate in order to create a numerator and denominator that are polynomials of Z. And you got it. All right? And so far, we've looked at low pass filters, making digital low pass filters. And high pass band pass and band stop filter designs, well, there are a number of ways of doing this. So, one way is you can make the analog low pass filter, make a digital low pass filter, and then Manipulate the digital low pass filter to get your band stop, band pass, or high pass. The other trickaroo that you can do is you have an analog low pass filter, you convert it in the analog domain into the other types of filters, and then you digitize that. If you do that, you have to use these transformations here. Okay? So, what you're going to need to do is if you want to go, let's say, from low pass to high pass, your S now is going to be equal to omega P, your uh, pass band frequency, and your omega P prime, your new cutoff frequency, right, divided by S, and then you have band pass, band stop. So you have to do these transformations to your low pass filter in order to establish these new cutoffs, right? And there's a little bit more description in section 10.4.2 of your textbook. And table 10.8 is great because it will give you all sort of the nitty gritty on how to do this. So you can do it one of two ways. If you like digital, do what digital folks do. Digitize it into low pass and manipulate it that way. If you want to play in the analog domain, if you have analog specs that you want to meet before you digitize it, then approach number two is the way to go. All right? Okay, with that... Uh, that concludes lecture 24 of ECE 503. And now I can turn off the mic.